good evening uh, we are going to talk on uh, map visualizations uh, in current lectures so let's see the definition of the map uh, visualizations so earlier we used to restrict ourselves or we were uh, as a human being were uh, uh, happy with a paper based uh, maps where we could find out a few features and based on that we used to do a map reading for explorations or uh, going from one places to the other places and so on. But in the current uh, world, the map visualization is being used for in, uh, interaction of different uh, spatial information which is being uh, represented. So if you take a basic definitions, uh, it's basically the computer supported visual representation of the data. As over here data is the spatial data to amplify the cognition. So basic purpose of uh, the map visualization is to amplify the cognition. So it means whatever activity we carry it out uh, during the map generation process, the final outcome should ensure that whoever is going to use that map, they are able to use their, uh, uh, they are able to use the maps for their own purposes but along with that they should also uh, the maps would also invite few questions understanding of uh, different uh, patterns associations and and so on so in nutshell what we can say is that uh, the basic purpose of the current uh, map based uh, geovisualization is to provide the insight into your spatial uh, data set. So whenever we say insight, so insight generally means that it should be uh, uh, should be a, or the uh, the person who is reading the map should be able to discover a new informations, either or it, it they may also able to uh, explain few of the phenomenon, or at the end, they may also be, be able to make a decision making. So there might be a kind of uh, or an and uh, involvement of uh, each of these goals. So each of the uh, visualizations should uh, enable discovery explanation on decision making, at least uh, one of them to, uh, to fulfill the basic definition of map uh, visualization. So we are going to talk uh, today basically the computer based uh, map making uh, process. So why does the map visualization works? It's basically uh, the purpose of uh, map visualization is just to represent a last, uh, the very vast inf uh, information, so special information in a, in a 2D uh, plane. So let's take an example of this uh, simple web based map and uh, it is being shown uh, over here. So uh, if you look into this uh, picture over here, so if anyone, let's say if I ask the questions to uh, a person sitting uh, maybe at the age of four or five, that what do you see in this uh, picture? So they may say, okay, we are seeing a green, a green color, some white and reddish color. There are a few lines going here and there. There are a few uh, blue lines, which is some places thicker or thinner and so on. So it's basically, uh, and there are a few places, labels are being put in into uh, in, in this uh, map. So if somebody looks to that, uh, then they will, uh, if they will just interpret only in terms of the colors and few places, they will say, okay, this is the map for a particular place. So they will stop at uh, uh, that place. But if you start looking closely to this map, then you can identify a lot of uh, other uh, uh, patterns. So let's take uh, a few examples that uh, there are few linear features coming from uh, three different places, which is uh, basically the uh, uh, east and uh, southeast uh, directions from the northeast directions and from west side. So these three uh, linear features are coming in place and uh, uh, at meeting somehow at uh, some place, so at least meeting at one point. 
Then there are also um, very large, or I should say the high density of the uh, linear features coming at the centers. But as we go away from these uh, places, we are seeing that the density of the road or the, uh, the color of the red colors is also vanishes. So if you start analyzing uh, these patterns, then this will uh, give or probably the, should uh, incite a few questions that why is it so that uh, all the different meeting at centers, what is so special about at centers that we are having a very large amount of red color? Why is it uh, as we go away from the centers, the uh, surrounding or the uh, basically the linear features densities goes down? So if you start answering the uh, uh, questions to that, then there were a lot of pattern and relationship you were able to establish because uh, all the red colors are actually a city. So it means as you enter from the outside city and come to the core of a city, you have a very high dense network of a road. So that, that gives the kind of indications that the high density of the road is a kind of in, uh, indications that the information which is being represented in this case is a city. So the people who are from Dehradun, they might uh, be able to identify these uh, uh, roads and corresponding informations. But let's say that uh, some alien is looking into this map and they are seeing suddenly there is a very high density at the centers. So based on that, they can easily identify, create what is the core, how much, what is the spread of the city, which all area is highly dense areas only on the basis of the line densities. So the current uh, map visualizations objective is to amplify and, and basically to induce the users to look into these specific patterns. So it is expected that the current map reader is no longer uh, the passive map readers, but rather than uh, involved and have some kind of uh, uh, manual interactions uh, with these maps. And, and these uh, during the interactions, they can do some panning, zooming, and other operations they can carry it out. And that should lead to an effective representation of the informations so that it can provide spatial pattern, relationship, trends, and so on. So the current uh, 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 map relation techniques, basic objective is to fulfill all these requirements apart from effectively representing the geographical data. Then let's have a look uh, of uh, this map as well. So in this map, generally, if you see, it's a basically showing the, the distribution of the temperature across India uh, from the Mossack site. So basic one snapshot or information which is being represented over here is that we are able to answer few basic questions or this maps can also be used for querying it. For example, uh, the questions might be, uh, uh, where is the temperature 30 degrees centigrade? So you can find out uh, from the color tables and based on that, you can identify the places where you're having the temperature 30 degrees centigrade and you can name them. In, we can also uh, questions in another way. So it means like we will be giving uh, information about the uh, place and you would like to know what is the temperature. So what is the temperature in the northeast, uh, northwest regions? So like in the northwest region, we are seeing a very high temperature indication. So that's around 41, 42 degree approximately. Uh, so in, in that range, it is coming. So we can easily say that, okay, in the northwest regions, we are having a, uh, the temperature of 41 degrees. So these kind of information when we are uh, represents and uh, these are called a thematic uh, informations and these thematic information helps us to identify or to uh, know about the spatial data in a particular geographical uh, context. 
So MAPI is no longer restricted to provide just the uh, what and where, but it is also able to provide a when uh, information. So in this case, uh, it's uh, it's basically a four different uh, snapshot of uh, data sets and living in four different uh, seasons, so like spring, summer, autumn, and uh, winter. And this is basically a map of the uh, Netherland, so it is showing the uh, the four different places, uh, four different seasons, and corresponding temperature di uh, distribution across the uh, country. Now, when whenever we look into these maps, there are a lot of uh, informations which we are going to get it from uh, this map. First information is that during the summer, all the places we are seeing of the color with a yellow tone. So that indicates that uh, majority of the or almost all of the years uh, is going to have a temperature of approximately uh, 10 to uh, 50 uh, degrees centigrade in the summer seasons, uh, especially in the spring seasons. In the summer season, it goes beyond uh, 20. Uh, so it's 20 or 25 that is being shown in the red and orange color. And again, in the autumn, it comes back to the 15, 20 range. Uh, and so we are seeing a very large portion of the uh, country is having uh, you know, 15 to 20 range. But that range is again in, uh, in the eastern side, the temperature is lesser, but in the uh, uh, other part of the country is actually having a slightly higher temperature. But in the winter season, we are seeing that uh, the uh, temperature is going in a minus uh, uh, 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. So if somebody looks into these maps, then we are able to answer the other question, like when is the minimum temperature which can be observed? So we can easily see that uh, from this map, uh, in the winter season, we'll be having the minimum temperature. But uh, we can also ask like where is the minimum temperature uh, in all the seasons? So we can identify those places and we can use it uh, and we can provide those informations. So in, in this case, uh, the map has been created and that has been put in into in a multiple uh, uh, snapshots. So it means that each of those snapshots is temperature or uh, time specific and that gives the information about uh, the particular uh, Season. So with this, uh, if you're creating a multi uh, timestamp uh, data sets, so that can, with those uh, timestamp data sets uh, maps, we can answer the when as well. So if you see in, in your data set, you expect it to have what, when, and where. So it means like you'll be having a thematic attribute, which is a part of what. Where is actually the geographical location? So it means the location of the area where information is, uh, is being or the thematic activities are available. And if you are using a temporal domain, so it means if you are ready to have a multiple snapshot of your data set, so you have to put some kind of effort for doing some extra survey and so on, then you will also able to answer the main question. So combinations of this basically gives you these uh, the spatial data spaces which is being used in uh, map visualization uh, process. So in, in Nutshell, uh, if, if you see that, uh, 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 there's a new term which is now being coined that is called uh, the geo visualizations. So under the geo visualization techniques, what happens is that you'll be having a data sets. So the data sets may be a categorical or it can be a quantitative data sets. So categorical data set is uh, the data set which can have either one of the classes. So it means, for example, let's say we are having a classes like uh, forest, agriculture, um, water bodies. So these are the land use classes which is there. So each of the place on the earth has to be grouped in one of these categories. There's no possibility that uh, we can put the uh, same place in two different categories. That's the first. Uh, um, characteristic of your categorical data. The second characteristic of your categorical data is that there is a no 
com uh, comparison can, cannot be carried out among the data sets. For example, you cannot say agriculture is uh, more than or better than the forest. Uh, if you're having a simple map available to you, you will not be able to answer that because if something is better than the other, there has to be some kind of scale. And in the categorical data set, especially in the case of nominal, there is no scale is available. And the, the, the purpose of the nominal data sets is only to give the name. So it means like you'll be able to distinguish, okay, this place is different from the other place, but you cannot say that this is better or that is better. You will not be able to answer it. So if you're having a data set like that, and that is called a categorical data sets of nominal type. Sometimes you may be having a categorical data sets which may have some inherent uh, ordinality. So it means your data set is going to have uh, a certain kind of order. For example, a very high uh, population density or very high temperature, medium temperature, low temperature. So it is a kind of very low, high, medium, and so on. Whenever we start using these uh, uh, modifiers. So those itself indicates that uh, they are, and these modifiers have some kind of uh, uh, hierarchy built in. So at least with these words, we can do some kind of comparison like uh, low will be lesser than the medium. So that's based on the word. We can make that uh, judgment and uh, but still it is in a categorical data. We cannot put it or we cannot compare that how much it is more better or medium is better than the low and so on. So if you're having any one of these two type of characteristic of a data set, those are categorical data sets, other one the quantitative data sets, which you can measure it with the scale, like for example, temperature or a population density. So you can say four times population mm -hmm. density at one place or uh, in some places we are having very high population density, two times, three times, like cities are, I mean, four times for population density or number of people living in cities four times compared to in per square kilometer compared to uh, in, in, in a rural uh, area and so on. You can also say uh, Delhi is having a five degree more temperature compared to, uh, let's say, um, Kashmir and so on. So if, if, if you if you're having such kind of comparisons where some numbers can be put in a scale, then you have a quantitative data set. So in, in geo visualization techniques, what happens is you're having a data set which is either categorical or quantitative data sets. And you what you do is you map them with, uh, with an appropriate visual structures, taking context of uh, geospatial locations. And finally, you put them in a two dimension space. Nowadays, you're also having a three dimension space uh, is available, uh, but uh, we are today's we are just restricting ourselves to two dimension representations. So once you put it, then map reader is finally going to see the final product and he will be able to uh, once he re once he reads it or sees it, then he will start questioning or uh, reasoning that why are you, uh, what are you trying to say from the information which you want to represent. So let's see that what uh, uh, in this map we are trying to uh, showcase. So if you look into this map, so it's basically an uh, uh, population density maps, uh, global population density map, which is uh, really available. So in this case, we are seeing that there are a uh, number of uh, person living in uh, in a per square kilometer. So the white color is actually the person of the uh, number of people living less than two per square kilometer, and uh, the it goes beyond number of people living. Five hundred uh, are the people who are living, or other five hundred people living in a per square kilometer, or more than that is being represented in a uh, pink color. So based on these uh, scales, the uh, representation of these maps have been put in. So once you put it, this maps uh, to the users, so one simple user will be uh, seeing that, okay, uh, the few of the places like uh, uh, is, uh, for example, the in, in the Southeast Asia, we are having a high population densities. 
And uh, in the you know, uh, northeast uh, or the northern regions, we are having a very less population densities and so on. So those kind of informations uh, can be carried out. So this is the first kind of information which immediately users can uh, uh, get it. But apart from that, uh, so that's why the uh, the uh, uh, that's the information which we can uh, easily get it at first. But some of your astute or maybe the, uh, the more advanced map readers, once they will see it, then they may ask a lot of different questions. That why is it that population density in Southeast Asian uh, region is quite high? Why there is a uh, population density which is, uh, uh, or maybe in the uh, American continent is only concentrated at uh, uh, coastal region? Why there is an uh, at the central or the at the top or the North African region is having a low uh, population, so when the population density is very less. So that's the second level of information uh, which some of the users may start asking, and that leads to a lot of hypothesis, which hypothesis can again be looked into more details, and uh, we can form uh, different hypotheses uh, why the population is uh, more high or so on, and that may lead to different kind of spatial analysis and other understanding. Uh, understanding of the uh, data distributions. So in NetCell, uh, the maps are not only restricted or not only for showing a particular attribute information, but your data representation should also invite uh, the uh, users to ask some additional questions beyond the uh, just representations when and where, but association between different uh, uh, places and their context can also be uh, put in. So in nutshell, uh, like your map user may say, OK, most of the people live in Asian subcontinents. That's how the conclusions, one of the conclusions can be made apart from the other conclusions. So if you see the overall perspective or the objective of geovalidation process is basically to form a mental model of information and its association it uh, associated with uh, a particular location. So that's the basic uh, purpose of uh, map visualizations. So since we are restricting ourselves to just to 2D visualizations, so whenever you want to create a map, so in any kind of GIS uh, analysis, at uh, whatever activity you will carry it out, at the end of that uh, activities of uh, earlier GIS analysis, will have some attribute associated with that. Uh, in some cases, magnitude, or sometimes it may be having a quality data set. So accordingly, the categorical or uh, um, the nominal data sets, by, uh, the nominal or maybe the quantitative data sets might be available to you, along with its locations. And once you have this, then you are going to do a representation of those data sets. So these representation has to be done uh, after taking the measurements, which is generally we take a field survey, or maybe nowadays uh, we are doing it some kind of surveying, uh, uh, aerial survey or the satellite based survey, and some attribute information can be collected as a sample. And based on that, we can do a uh, attributing of all the data sets. And finally, we apply a few basic principles of cartographic design principle that there has to be a few elements. The map information has to be put in in an appropriate uh, way um, so that it looks and the users should get an appropriate or enough attention of your informations and so on. So we'll just try to see the uh, different process steps involved in this case, uh, apart from uh, uh, annotating or uh, the map element informations along with the different uh, map elements. So before going that, just uh, have a look of a few of the basic category of map. One is a topographical uh, uh, maps, we call it. So it's basically full of uh, 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 different uh, names, uh, especially linear features, or sometimes you may have a special uh, or the polygon features. 
and it will have a lot of details available to me. So basic purpose of all these topographic maps are just to give an idea about the locations. And if your map reader is going to have a particular topographic maps, then he or she should be able to fix its positions uh, on this map by looking in the surrounding areas and matching it with the different uh, topographic uh, features which has been labeled in this map. Then there's a thematic map, so it's it's basically the uh, uh, the map where uh, the attribute information was is being provided to you, and based on that, the maps is being created. So this is just an example of chloroplate map, uh, which is being uh, <coughs> which is uh, just showing you know, the different level of organizations, rate of organizations in uh, different continents. So basic. Uh, one of the important aspects we should know that whenever you, you want to create a topographic map, so you have to make sure that uh, uh, the map features should be put in in such a way that map, root, uh, map reader is able to fix his or her positions in a map locations by uh, looking into surrounding area. That's why in most of the topographic map will have a man-made features which will ha be having a lot of uh, different uh, important places uh, which which uh, which can easily be identified like uh, or like high mountain locations in few places the more uh, very famous uh, buildings road names and those things has to be present but these this topographic map has to be put in into a context of its uses so if it is a a simple wall based uh, map or for navigations accordingly the topographic features has to be represented and these topographic has the features has to be represented or has to be put in with an appropriate information at a different uh, scale so in, in in map making process the first step is that you are going to do a data classification so all your data set is having an attribute and based on that attribute, you are going to um, represent the main data sets. So this is just an example of uh, different uh, wards uh, of the Arabian city. And you're having total 60 different uh, ward which is being uh, shown. So this is basically the, uh, the different wards and which is being represented in this case. So if you if someone looks into that, so at max he or she will be able to uh, say, OK, there are a lot of places where uh, few polygons are there and they're having few colors. And probably there is some uh, uh, relationship between them or may not be the relationship which may exist. So that kind of uh, confusion state will be there in your uh, map readers. So actually, this uh, this is representing the uh, one particular column of your uh, map. But the basic problem in this case is that even what is being represented, uh, the user will feel kind of lost. Uh, they will not be able to uh, realize that is it a kind of single entity or is the some information is having some kind of integrations or relationship those kind of things is not coming and that's why this maps information looks uh, fragmented now the same information but slightly being organized and has been put in into uh, in another uh, representations now in this case if you if you if you look into the map on the right hand side and compare it with the left hand side the people who is going to read the right hand ma side maps will feel a um, uh, uh, comfortable compared to on the left hand side map. So first comfort comes with the number of colors which is there. So it is only just few number of colors where in the left hand side you're having a very large number of colors, quite confused. But as you look into the number of colors on the left hand side, so that gives the kind of uh, controlled balance uh, information of the, uh, the data sets. Apart from that, since we are having uh, almost uh, uh, similar kind of colors uh, being associated, uh, or in this case, uh, on the right hand side, the five different colors is being used. 
so users may also start looking that uh, there may be some specific relationship which may exist uh, among the uh, data sets and uh, he to interpret that particular informations he or she will require a kind of additional informations which we call it a lesion so without the lesion informations the user will not be able to interpret so actually the attribute information in this case is the population density of uh, different wards of uh, their city and uh, each, the meaning of each of the color is being provided at the reason. So in this case, high, low, uh, medium, or very high can easily be identified. So if, what are the places where we are having a medium density? So just try to match it with the uh, green color. And based on that, you can easily make, okay, these are the different uh, polygons, which is located at center or uh, basically southwest region of the city are almost having a kind of medium uh, population densities. So uh, then again, if you next time, if you ask him where is the high, again, he or she needs to look into the descent and again, uh, they, will, they will come back and will be able to answer it. So each time if you ask uh, the informations, they would, like, they would like to have a kind of access to the, uh, uh, the descent which is available to them. Now the same informations, what we will do is, we are going to represent in a completely different way. So in this case, what we have done is, we have removed the multicolor options and we have used the same color, but the color saturations has been uh, basically put in with respect to the gradation of your values. So it means like how uh, the way the value is being represented, accordingly the color is also being so in the previous case, the data was uh, kind of categorical in nature. So it means uh, very low, high, and medium density was there. But now in this case, we are having a quantitative data set. So it means we are having a population densities uh, numbers given in, in, in few uh, digits. So maybe hundreds to uh, some thousand uh, number of people uh, in, 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 uh, in that sense. So that's basically this histogram is basically showing the distribution of the, uh, uh, the populations of each of those uh, parts. So if you start looking into this, and if you use an appropriate color where the lower value or lower intensity uh, of the color indicates the lower value, and as the saturation of the color increases, the higher values. Now, if you look into this uh, particular map, if you want to do relative comparison, which is high, which is low, and so on, based on simply color, user will be able to answer it. So in this case, there's no additional requirement of using this there. The information is same as it was the first case, which we have seen. But in the first case, we are using the multicolor options. So it means each of the numeric values, whatever you have, that all of these numeric values were given individual colors. But now the color has been converted, the multicolor has been converted to a single color, and the density of uh, uh, saturation of the color is now being increased with the increasing values. So, with this just simple manipulation of the color or visual uh, component and uh, keeping the other information intact. We see there's a lot of improvement in understanding of the map reading capabilities. So this is the a simple examples where the use of appropriate cartographic design or component tools is an important component and uh, that can help or ease the map readers to understand uh, the spatial patterns. And along with that also, uh, uh, um, the need of additional information can be taken on. So in, if, if you look into this, so if you see there are total 60 wards, so effectively we have used 60 different colors. Each color is uh, being put in uh, or is being, uh, we can say is the color uh, saturation is directly linked to the value of the population density or the numeric values. But even though I have used the 60 colors uh, over here, but if I ask you a questions that 
how many different colors do you see? So most of you may end up with four, five, six at max. So you see that there's a loss of uh, you know, additional color tables. I mean, the, uh, if you think if you think in terms of the resources, I'm using 60 colors, but my end user is only able to interpret five or six colors. So it means there are at least 90% of the color is wasted. So that wasting of that color is being observed in this case because user is not able to perceive the differences between nearby values. And the other thing is like, are we seeing any kind of specific meaningful uh, association between the different uh, component, like in this case, different polygons? That is also is uh, missing in this case. So to overcome that, what we do is we do a kind of classification approach. So in this case, what we do is we try to minimize the number of classes uh, or, or group the values in such a way that it maintains the some kind of specific meaning. So this specific meaning has to be linked to a specific purpose. For example, let's say if I am having the uh, these data sets, and I would like to say that uh, almost similar kind of values should be given the same colors. So similar kind of values we need to define. That what is the meaning of similar kind of values? So whenever we say similar kind of value, then it means that their value has to be almost nearby. So natural break classification techniques actually helps in doing that. So this algorithm ensures that uh, if there is any abrupt changes, then uh, uh, that becomes a boundary of the classes. And this natural breaks uh, classification also helps us to bring out the uh, subclasses which is which we want to uh, observe or which you would like to know uh, uh, is present or not. So in most of the cases, generally by default, the GIS software will always have a kind of uh, natural break classification because at the beginning, we'll be interested that is there any subcategory which is existing in this case. So based on the natural way, uh, uh, classification and, and five classes, we can easily identify it as a quite large amount of uh, 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 places which are nearby and having a similar kind of value. So this shows that on the spatial histogram, uh, on the attribute space, that is the histogram, we are seeing the nearby values. And that is also getting translated into a special uh, uh, dimension, uh, special uh, information. And that's why the nearby polygons is uh, almost having a similar kind of, uh, or falls into the similar kind of uh, category of classifications. The, so, so the uh, equal interval classification, natural break classification is just one of the techniques. Apart from that, there are also an equal interval technique. So what we do, we take a total range of your histogram and break them into equal classes. So it's a traditional uh, statistical approach, like you do a class interval 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to uh, 20, and so on. So the way we are having a fixed size of the classes, in the equal interval ensures that each of the classes values in the attribute spaces are also of fixed size. And based on the classification, this can be, uh, uh, can be done. So based on the equal interval, the classification is being uh, done in this case. Now you see the information is same, but the grouping mechanism has been changed. So in the previous case, we are, we are working with the natural breaks. Then now we are doing equal interval. Apart from that, there are other also quantile based approach. So it means that your, your data set is getting divided into um, on the basis of their rank. So it means first 20, then next 20, and next 20, and so on. So you just do an ascending order sorting, and we just start selecting the 25, 20-20% uh, in this case, five classes are there. So 20-20% in this case is being going to be uh, multiple classes. So quantile is another approach which is being uh, carried out. Same way we can also do a data classification based on a standard deviation. So it means like you take an average value of all the data sets and then you, you take the deviation of uh, the data point on the left and the right. So polygons, which is 
the left side of the mean, right side of the mean, and one scale, one standard deviation scale or two standard deviation scale. And based on that, they are getting mapped into a spatial domain, and you see the distribution of the uh, maps on a scale. Then there are also geometrical intervals. So it means like uh, as the uh, data values goes, uh, as as the data values goes in higher range, the growth or changes which is expected to a lesser and lesser. So it means at the uh, later uh, part of the classes are expected to have a lesser, uh, have, uh, expected to have a wider range of uh, data sets compared to uh, the earlier uh, or small value of uh, classes. So if if you're having so many classi uh, classification uh, techniques, so generally the questions might arise why there are so many classification techniques and why do we need it? Uh, the so many classifications techniques. Is it better to have a single or smaller or number of classification techniques? So to answer to that is that uh, the purpose of the map becomes an important aspect that which of the classification techniques which uh, we should use. And the uh, the basic purpose of the, the first basic purpose of the map is that uh, the uh, whatever information is there, uh, which map the producer wants to convey, that should be there. Apart from that, readers should be able to interpret that map, map effectively. So generally, if you if you want to make some informations to the map readers, so the map readers will be able to interpret your maps effectively. If it has a lesser information, so it means five, six, seven, or eight classes should be good enough. So generally, it is being considered five is good enough uh, classes for general mass conventions. In some cases, uh, you may go to sixteen to fifteen to sixteen classes. In very special cases, specific target audience, uh, you may go up to thirty-two or thirty. Or, um, classes, but beyond that, the if if you're having the classes more than that, then generally it becomes a uh, very difficult to interpret, and only very specific users, your audience, uh, will be there will be able to interpret your maps. So that's why if your uh, target user is quite wide with a diverse uh, background, then you should have a lesser classes, and if you have a very specific narrow down and you want to convey a large uh, variation in your data set and you want to make sure that that variation in your data set should also be interpreted by the map readers, then you can go for a higher number of classes. But to do this exercise, what happens is generally two issues may arise. One is that if you uh, have lesser classes, then there will be uh, the kind of losses of your data sets because the nearby classes will get merged and your data will become more and more general. So uh, in one extreme, you put all the 60 words into one class. So if you put all the information in one class, in a single layer, we can represent it. That's the, uh, in that case, the individual variation which is expected in your data set gets lost. Now, Take the another cases where you would like to maintain the variability among the different uh, special uh, objects. So in that case, the accuracy or the proper representation of your after classification of the data set remains, uh, and it is more appropriate, and that will remain there. So or as a map producer, you will always have to make these uh, trade-off between these two. Do you want to have an underlying? Uh, Data to be as accurate or as detailed as it is present in your data set, then interpretation of the data becomes difficult. If you generalize too much, then the, the data, underlying data variability gets lost. So some way where in between uh, you have to make a choice, and that's basically is being done on the basis on the purpose of the goal of your map. So your goal is, as I said, like, specific, very large, and so on. Uh, and that goal is also will be depending upon the kind of information which you want to represent. Like you want to represent uh, the informations uh, uh, to 
to one and two people or you want to represent the information for the large number of people. And accordingly, you have to use the color symbols also. So once you have decided all this, then still there's a question that which particular class uh, uh, data sets we should use and how do actually fit the purpose apart from these visual appearance. So that will lead to a question that how many classes, if you put too many, too few, then the patterns of the data set will get lost. If too many, then confusion map readers will be there and difficult for, for them, it will be difficult to use. So all the different classification techniques which we have seen, there's still uh, the questions remains that you have made somehow trade based on your in-map users and so on, that this is the number of classes I'll be going in. So I'll be going four classes, five classes, six or 10 classes based on your target audience and understanding of your data sets. The next question, okay, you have 10 classes, but which methods should I apply? Should I apply manual classes? Should we go for equal intervals and apply natural break and so on? So this, this particular thing, uh, to answer these questions, again, uh, you have to uh, consider or you have to evaluate your final purpose. What do you want to bring it uh, up front? Do you want to bring the subclasses which is present in your data set? So for example, let's say I'm having a per capita income of different countries and you would like to show that uh, the, uh, uh, if, if, if the annual uh, or average uh, GDP uh, of, uh, on the earth of individual is some number X, then that is not an effective representation of the and data set, but there are subclasses like there are uh, developed countries which is having some kind of uh, similar kind of uh, values in the GDP number. There are developing countries, underdeveloped countries, and so on. So all these subgroups which we expect, if you are interested in trying to bring out that data set, then you should go for a natural break cases. In case of hierarchy, if you want to bring out, so you want to identify top 20, top 30, middle, uh, or the bottom 20, so that you can bring out the contrasts, contrast in terms of spatial distributions, and so on, then in those cases, you can use the quantile. If you want to bring out the complete disparity, that you want to say, say that the mean value is not the true representation, but there exists a huge disparity. So. So that particular figures can be, if, if the purpose is that one, then in those cases you should the standard deviations. And the other, uh, sometimes you may not be uh, thinking these statistical based approach is giving you a correct answer. So you would like to break your and provide the uh, class interval according to your requirement, and that's you can do it manually and so on. So the example of the, uh, such classifications uh, we can see easily, uh, like equal interval, uh, you can use a specific number of classes and these classes has a different number of observations. In the quantile, you divide the number of observations in each class. And as you see the sum classes, as you go up and up, they, the variations in the classes also decreases. So it means the class interval becomes uneven. Natural breaks, as we said, can help you in identifying the subgroups. Standard deviation basically leads to finding out the extreme disparity which may exist. And in this figure, if you see the map distribution, it's quite interesting that uh, on the south uh, west regions, there are uh, a few polygons which is having, which is falling three standard deviation on the upper side, and just beside that there are a few polygons, which is at the negative or the other side of the three standard deviation scales. So that, that, that indicates that the extreme diversifications of your data set exist in, in, in this case. And if such situation occurs, then we may look for the reason, why is it so that suddenly what happens that uh, the very uh, extreme positive side uh, people are existing and just beside that there are on the other extreme uh, the polygons are existing. So we can look into these uh, special patterns and phenomena to look into that. 
So this basically shows that based on the different classification and uh, techniques, your map visualization looks quite different, but each of them selection will be based on what your final purpose is there. So how will you decide if you are completely doing any statistical based approach, then you will do it based on the uh, classifications, distributions can be selected and based on the, the kind of cumulative histogram which you have. If your histogram is quite linear, then you can go for equal interval. If it is in sigmoid shape at the diagonal, around the diagonal, then you should go for natural breaks. If you are having, uh, and then uh, as it goes uh, in extremes, it means like there is a longer tail or longer head, so you can go from arithmetic to uh, geometrical to uh, reciprocal or the harmonic based classifications to represent your data sets. This is an example of these uh, few representations. And the maps can also be represented in the uh, form where we can put multi attribute data sets. So this is just an example of uh, those uh, data sets. With this, I uh, will end this uh, session and uh, we'll be taking a question. Sir.